Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and I just wanted to acknowledge uh, my husband, Carl Stoppelfeld, who unfortunately couldn't be here and contributing uh, greatly to this talk. And also uh, some, some of you other folks here will see your names go by because I think we have a lot of the debris disc people here in the audience. Uh, Jeff Bryden, and we certainly uh, have uh, Mark Wyatt and, and other folks. Anyway, I'm going to start off, uh, Meredith did such a wonderful job of talking about the astrophysics of discs. Much of this does apply to debris disks, uh, only we're talking about much less material. But I'm going to talk about, a little bit about the history of finding debris disks uh, with large infrared surveys. Uh, talk then more about short wavelength scattered light imaging, where we can get uh, phenomenal uh, uh, spatial resolution. And then I'll talk uh, about a case study and using the WISE uh, uh, satellite to, to find some new uh, debris disks to image at high resolution, thermal infrared imaging of debris disks, uh, where we're making a lot of pro progress recently, and then just do a little inventory of the known debris disks and talk about the future. So, of course, the original debris disk that we all know about here is the zodiacal light that we can see from the Earth that's caused by interplanetary dust particles from collisional processes uh, with, with asteroids and comets. It's, it's concentrated in the ecliptic plane. The, the median particle size is pretty small, about 30 microns. Uh, and it is a very small uh, uh, contribution to the total light from our solar system, 10 to the minus 7th of the light from our sun. Uh, but we think that that might or might not be pretty typical of main sequence stars. But we'll come back to this later. So you can see here the, the Zodi which you can see on a very dark night if you are far from Los Angeles. Uh, if you go to a uh, longer wavelength, say 25 microns, and even with a, a, uh, an explorer that was built for a very different uh, purpose, the Cosmic Microwave Background Explorer, uh, you see this 25 micron emission right along the zodiacal uh, plane, and then here, here goes the galactic plane. Uh, so. So our solar system has a warm debris disk. It is a very faint one, but it's there. And it, and it and kind of clouds up uh, some of the other ones we want to find sometimes. So the, the, this inner zodi is produced by our asteroid belt. Here are our asteroids in the, in the main belt. And this is the Kuiper belt further out, uh, which produces uh, more dust. We haven't seen that zodi, uh, uh, the outer zodi belt yet, really, because we have to look through the inner one. So our first exploration into finding debris disks was not like uh, when we were looking for uh, young uh, stars. Uh, I mean, Titari stars and Herbig AEB stars were first found spectroscopically from the ground with, uh, by their uh, fancy emission lines and being in dark clouds. But uh, we had to go to space, basically, to see debris disks for the first time. So, our first foray into this was the IRAS mission uh, in the 1980s. It was an all-sky survey, a, a pretty large telescope as these things go, uh, 60 centimeters, uh, but very poor resolution for the time, a very primitive instruments. Uh, about a Jansky, it was, uh, it was typical sensitivity. So naturally, IRAS only found the brightest things in the sky. Uh, one great thing about IRAS, though, was the folks right here at, at Caltech uh, made a wonderful catalog that we still use today. And here is the 100 micron sky from IRAS, which is, uh, which is still a lovely thing. So as Meredith talked about, uh, IRAS, of course, immediately uh, went to work in telling us all about spectral energy distributions from uh, young stellar objects. And we have been able to use uh, the, the spectral energy distributions to, to target uh, individual bright objects in nearby star forming regions and say, okay, well, the earliest stages uh, what we call class zero from their spectral energy distribution, all very cold. Well, Spitzer took a lovely picture of uh, L1527 here, which looks a lot like the cartoon. So class one, here is uh, edge on disk, uh, IRAS 04302, done with NICMOS. So basically, uh, uh, big surveys like uh, IRAS did uh, form the, 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 the target list for higher resolution follow-up. And these are all lovely Hubble pictures of, of different stages of, of disk evolution. 
So here we start with debris disks. Uh, IRAS discovered as a, uh, as a part of its calibration, it was using eight nearby bright A stars for calibration, that some of them had way too much infra uh, infrared excess uh, at long wavelengths. And so the Fab Four, uh, Vega, Fomalhaut, Epsilon, Airy, and Beta Pick, as uh, some of the, the nearest uh, A stars, and, uh, and one that's a little later type there, just popped out of the database. Uh, and these are, of course, called debris disks now because, as, as Meredith told us, uh, the, the, uh, the small dust particles have to be replenished by collisional processes from planetesimals. So here is uh, the, the, the solar photosphere, uh, or the, the, uh, the star, and then here's the infrared excess from the disk. Uh, and so the legacy of IRAS is that it has an all-sky survey. It found the brightest sources uh, for us here. You know, there are, are zillions of references to IRAS, but uh, in the era of the Hubble Space Telescope and some of these early high contrast imaging efforts, uh, IRAS has been the, the, the major source of targets to begin with. However, many IRAS sources, because the beam is huge, you know, like an arc minute, uh, ended up being combinations of several sources, and we still suffer from this today with our newer surveys. So moving on, uh, Spitzer was a follow-up to IRAS. However, it's a more of a general purpose observatory, still in operation today, much, much higher sensitivity than IRAS, but it does not cover the whole sky. So we have wonderful targeted surveys of uh, nearby stars and, and stars in star-forming regions, stars that were already known to be young, uh, and have found hundreds of more uh, debris disk candidates. And of course, lovely pictures of uh, star-forming regions like this one in Ophiuchus. And Spitzer also enabled us to, to look at the, the frequency of infrared excess as a function of age and also spectral type. So here you can see that at 70 microns, you get a very high uh, frequency of occurrence of, uh, of debris disk type excess in A stars and that that decreases uh, towards later types. Okay, well here we are also looking at, at age uh, versus excess and that the frequency of, of uh, substantial excess over the photosphere goes down dramatically from the young stars to ones that are hundreds of millions of years old to where it's a very rare occurrence by the time you get to a giga year or more. So, uh, so we have Spitzer, we have IRAS, well, uh, we had a new generation of infrared instrumentation, big arrays. Uh, we decided that going back to doing an all-sky survey, at least at the mid-infrared wavelengths, was a good idea uh, to take advantage of that. The all-sky survey will then be able to push out beyond that few uh, uh, tens of parsecs that uh, IRAS was able to see, even for the brightest types of stars, and to give us uh, a better view for things you know, like brown dwarfs and, uh, and ultra-luminous infrared galaxies, but also debris disks. So here's, here's James Webb, which will uh, take advantage of what we've done with the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer. So uh, WISE covered the whole sky. It, you know, it's been working on these problems like wide dwarfs and ULERGs and providing another lasting catalog. Uh, so here's some information on it. However, it is a tiny telescope. It's, it's about the size of a trash can. It's 40 centimeters across. And thus, the resolution at 22 microns, which is the longest wavelength, is only about 12 arc seconds. So that's a heck of a lot better than IRAS. But it is, uh, you know, it also admits a lot of, uh, as we say, vermin into the, the beams. So here I am uh, standing next to, to WISE before we launched. So another player in this game is now the Herschel Space Telescope that just finished up its, its mission recently, a much bigger telescope uh, looking at 70 microns and beyond, and it has uh, better sensitivity and resolution than Spitzer, and it also has done some large surveys. So these are the sources for our, uh, for our studies of debris disks, and we now have several hundred debris disks and debris disk candidates. Uh, that we have not resolved but have detected and that we now have the ability to follow up uh, with these higher resolution tools. So why do we need to go and, and 
image these things in high resolution. So it, it, we want to see what the basic disk morphology is, uh, you know, what is the size, what is the inclination. You need to, to find out about a, a axisymmetric or non-axisymmetric structure that may be related to planet formation. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of information you can find out about the grains. But the main thing is that if, when you're doing uh, modeling of the uh, spectral energy distribution, what you find out is that a lot of properties of these disks are degenerate. I mean, there are several ways in which the model can achieve the same result uh, in the end, uh, but that getting uh, resolved images of these sources, especially at high resolution, uh, really can break the degeneracies and let you know what's really going on. So I'm going to start out with talking about scattered light imaging. This is currently dominated by Hubble, although there's certainly uh, a number of ground-based ground facilities that, that are now in the running. Uh, the great thing about scattered light imaging is that you can get uh, very, very high resolution uh, with relatively uh, small telescopes, as Hubble is. So I'll just start by going back to our old friends, the, the young stellar objects, and to say that uh, this is a game of contrast at short wavelengths. You need to hide your central star somehow. And uh, one way you can do it with the optically thick young stellar objects is to look for edge-on disks where the optically thick disk hides the star and thus you can magically see a lot of structure in the, the material, the dusty material around the star. Uh, so here are a couple of edge-on disks. Here's another one that's bi in a binary system which is kind of warped. That's pretty cool and a couple of, of jets coming out in a different way. Here's a, a new one is blinking back and forth between the model of the disk and the, the picture of the disk, and that's a, a, a very nice new edge on disk source, but these are not debris disks. These are, uh, uh, these are young objects, and there are dozens of these young stellar objects that are either edge on disks or you know, PSF subtractions of uh, young stellar objects uh, that, that are known now. So beta pick was actually found from the ground back in the 80s, uh, but after that time, there was a long dry period when nobody could find anyone else. It's, it's very young and it's very close and it's very edge on and that makes it uh, easy to find because it has, for a debris disk, it has a lot of material, it's edge on, so it stands out better, uh, and it's easier to see, uh, and it's very, very nearby, so it's large. So we had to wait for HST and adaptive optics to kind of catch up with the infrared uh, data that we knew about. So this is sort of the general way that we do it with, with Hubble in terms of finding debris disks. Uh, you take a, a couple of different uh, images uh, of, of your star at different roll angles of the telescope. You subtract it. You may use uh, all sorts of different algorithms to do this. In the early days, what we did was to take a picture of a different star, a PSF star, and subtract it. But in any case, this is using STIS. Uh, you do a, a differencing and and lo and behold, you come out with a nice uh, debris disk here that's, that's quite faint. Uh, so what does uh, beta pick look like these days? Well, it's, it's actually uh, back in 2006, there was a nice set of, of Hubble images here uh, that were taken showing at different wavelengths uh, that you've got this inner warp uh, in here and the outer disk, and it's wonderfully narrow. There's actually uh, some some atomic gas in this system that you can get a nice rotation curve out of. There's also CO. Again, it's, it's a young system that still has some uh, material in it. And of course, here's a nice ground-based picture showing uh, the uh, beta pick B planet that was uh, discovered a few years back. And uh, the inclination of this system has been being worked on, but it looks like it's actually close enough, the, the orbit is close enough to edge on where there might even be a transit in the future for us, uh, for this system. And we don't yet know whether the warp that's seen is related to this object or whether it's something else lurking in that system. So another one that has been, uh, that's one of the original Fab Four from IRAS is Fomalhaut. Uh, and with a lot of work, uh, HST detected this, uh, this nice ring and scattered light that is very, very sharply uh, sculpted on its inner edge. Here's a, here's a trace across that. And it's brighter on the east side. It has forward scattering, some small grains. Uh, this one has been studied uh, intensively. And of course, everybody has heard about the, the still a little bit controversial 
uh, source here, the Fomalhaut B uh, planet, uh, which is, uh, was thought to be the source of the, the sculpting uh, of this, but now is known to be a, a, a ring crosser. So there's also some, uh, some indication that it may be associated with a dust cloud or have big rings. It's too bright for uh, most planet models in, in the optical. So I think we're going to be waiting for JW to, uh, to do some more work and tell us what this thing really is. So in, in the nature of rings, we now, uh, with further uh, looks at, at Spitzer uh, targets, we've found uh, very faint, large rings. This one does not have a sharp inner edge. This is one of the faintest one we've seen, but it is clearly asymmetric. Uh, it, the star is offset from the center of the ring. These eccentric rings are, again, also uh, often thought to be associated with uh, the presence of uh, with a planet that is as yet unseen. So here are a couple of, of uh, other rings. Uh, here's one that's close to edge on. These were done with ACS back in the days when it was uh, uh, in the game for coronography, and, and currently STIS is, is the major player there. So here's uh, an F star and a K star. One is more face on and one is more edge on. Uh, one of my favorites here, HD 15115, we call the blue needle because it's uh, much, much brighter on one side than the other. And one of the, the ways in which this could happen uh, for a debris disk is for there to be a recent collision on one side of the disk, or there may be some, some sort of interaction or a flyby with, uh, with another star. Uh, and here's a, a case of a transition type disk, uh, uh, 141569, I think, that this one may look like if it was seen face on. So one of the most beautiful edge on disks, uh, and is around a nearby M star, is AU MIC, uh, 12 million year old, it's uh, another beta pick moving group type of object with a cleared inner hole, a flat surface density. The, uh, uh, the scattering properties of the grain in this system show that they're very small. It's also notable and having been also done uh, at longer wavelengths, you can find out what the albedo is of the grains and they are extremely high uh, relative to say Fomalhaut that only has maybe less than 10% uh, reflectivity. This one is is uh, maybe up to 70 or 80 percent. So uh, one of the other properties you can see uh, from about scattered light from debris disks and also from young stellar object disks is that the scattered light is very polarized. And so you, you have a peak polarization in this, uh, in this case of 41 percent. It's single scattering and it gives us some information about the grain properties but it also provides a lever onto other ways to detect the, the, the scattered light with using polarization uh, and ground-based coronagraph. So here's uh, some different disks, debris disks with different degrees of forward scattering. We've got the smaller grains, probably AU MIC, and larger grains as we go towards G equals zero, uh, and, and that gives us uh, information about uh, you know, perhaps some of the mechanisms involved in generating uh, the grains in these systems. Something else that we see and are starting to see now that we have more of an assembly of debris disks at, at ultra high resolution is that some of them seem to, to be interacting with the interstellar medium. In these cases, the, the, the proper motion of the star is like this way and like that way and like this way. And so they seem to be bowed back as they're interacting with, uh, with some of the interstellar medium. And just for comparison, here is a, a star with a 24 micron bow shock as it's, it doesn't have a disk, but it's plowing through, the, uh, uh, through some dense interstellar medium and it's, and it's building up a shock. So you can get some combination of a circumstellar structure and interstellar interaction in these systems. Also, these things are good astrophysical mimics for debris disks and, and often show up in uh, surveys and one need, has to be careful about those in certain regions. Uh, Chris Stark, who I think is, is here, uh, has a nice paper on HD181327 with uh, some new multi-role stis coronography. You can see this strong asymmetry in this system, uh, potentially due to a recent collision, also maybe uh, an ISM interaction. It's got a strong forward scattering uh, like some of the others, but this is just a, a lovely uh, ring system. Uh, 
This is another one of the many astrophysical objects that I've heard Eye of Sauron uh, applied to. Uh, and here's a young K star at, at, at 22 parsecs uh, from ACS. Uh, again, a nice uh, tight small disk here after PSF subtraction. Here's one that's still in preparation and very, very faint. We are now getting to the point where uh, some of these things are really a challenge for Hubble to see. Uh, this one, we've got uh, nice pictures in, in, at Herschel, and that, that helps us uh, select our targets. So, and, and here's yet another one, an F9 star, again, a very faint disk, another one that has good, uh, good data at longer wavelengths, telling us that there should be material out there that, that Hubble could see. So, uh, when these things were found, some of them were found by with PIC-2 in the early days of Hubble, some of them were found uh, by Nick Bose, uh, going back with STIS and revisiting more thoroughly, has given us absolutely gorgeous pictures of, of, some, of, the, uh, of some of these, but still we're, we're really limited to uh, maybe 15 or 16 of these sources that are done at, at really high resolution. Some more are being picked out of the archive using these, these new algorithms. Uh, there are some posters uh, on, on this, the, the ALICE project, uh, uh, looking, and this is, uh, uh, you know, 181327, uh, you can see the ring much more nicely, but again, we, we heard the talk yesterday about being careful about subtracting maybe too much of this uh, big halo out here on your way to looking at the high frequency components to it. And here are some ones that, that are newly discovered in scattered light by looking through the archive. So the ground-based, uh, you know, big telescopes are also into this game in a big way. A lot of the work that they've been doing has been on the younger sources, the transitional disks, like this beautiful spiral here that we heard about. But there's some edge-on debris disks that are easier to see structure in with a, in these cases where the strel ratio, and you still have a large AO halo, uh, the, uh, the, the edge-on disks are easier to pick out of that. So you know, there's some nice resolution uh, pictures that are coming out, and, and of course, uh, that's not the only one with, with spiral structure and non-axisymmetric structure, uh, all sorts of things, in, uh, and thanks to Carol for, for this nice slide with, the, with Subaru and, and Haichau results. But again, these are mostly, uh, mostly the younger AEB EE type stars. Uh, so I'll just do a little case study here showing what the process is for going through one of these large infrared surveys so I did a, a, a looking through the WISE database, uh, found hundreds of, of potential debris disks, and out of those I picked out ones that had pretty large uh, fractional excesses of greater than 10 to the minus 4 that were nearby, uh, that were robust and were seen with, with Herschel as well. So putting, pulling in a bunch of different databases here to, to so, select some pretty ideal targets. So I, I took 13 targets, observed these with Hubble, and thought, well, you know, great, I'm going to get 13 nice pictures of debris disks. Well, unfortunately, this is never the case. Okay, so I went with a STIS coronagraph, two rolls each. Uh, it's a clear filter, so there's not a lot of color information there, but the pixel sizes are very small. So here are just some spectral energy distributions with, uh, you know, two mass, Wise, and Herschel put in there showing that you have, uh, you know, some that are very cold and some that are, that are warmer. Some may have uh, more than one uh, component of, of uh, excess uh, and may have more than one belt. So these are from G, F, and a B star, 50 to 110 parsecs. Some of them are related to young associations. One isn't. Uh, they have some indications that they're young. So out of these, uh, six of them are just nothing, okay? This is what the, uh, the residuals are from the PSF uh, subtraction with uh, using the, the two different roles. This is what a non-detection looks like. You know, some of them have lots of friends nearby, but, but nothing that looks like scattered light. Uh, unfortunately, a couple of them are chance superpositions of stars and galaxies. You wish that you got rid of all of these things. If there ha wasn't a honking bright star right here, then you would have seen, especially in this one, there's this huge galaxy sitting right next to the star, but it was completely hidden under the skirts of the PSF. So uh, here's a marginal detection. You've got the bright star at two different roll angles, and you can see that there's maybe a little bit of something, a little bit of fluff there, but not a whole lot of th stuff that you could model in this case. One of these very faint disks and a small one as well. 
and this one is kind of interesting in that uh, it, it almost looks like uh, two uh, disks or, or something. It might even be interstellar there. So it's, uh, and it's pretty large, almost 2,000 AU across. Maybe, it, it's, maybe it's close to an edge-on system with strong spiral arms, or maybe, again, it's an interstellar thing. We'll have to study this system a lot more. Now we're getting around to the beta pick level of excess, so 10 to the minus 3 LD over L star. And here is where Hubble really comes into its own in terms of being able to pick these things out. Uh, here's another one like this. This is uh, another one that looks like it may be uh, affected by the interstellar medium. Uh, this one is, is also a, a young source. Uh, here's a B star. They're all young. And it's got a great big structure around it with a lot, with a lot of interesting structure that we might be able to to, to take a look at, but again, this is probably something that, that's not too different from some of the transition disks that have been, been seen in terms of its age, uh, and it is a huge structure. So disk or nebula, uh, it's big one way or the other. This is what we were looking for. Okay, so this is a 13 AU, 1300 AU diameter uh, edge-on system. Uh, it's the brightest of the ones that, that we looked at, uh, and it is if we look over here, we see this suggestion of a little bifurcation here, like there are two different inclinations, two different belts uh, of, of uh, dust going on in this system. Uh, and there's also a suggestion that maybe there's an inner warp in this system, that the outer parts of the disk are maybe on a different uh, inclination than the inner parts of the disk. You can see drawing a line through you know, the middle of the inner parts does not quite trace the outer parts. The other thing you can see is that, uh, you know, if you do a cut across it, that one side of it can, is many times brighter than the other. So this is, jives very well with what Mark Wyatt has been saying about what you would expect to see in a, in a case where there's been a recent collision. So this is, uh, this is another nice one to follow up. So anyway, I'm just going to go uh, in the next part here and move from scattered light imaging to thermal infrared imaging. And so uh, we are moving to the, the realm of Herschel and, and, uh, and Spitzer primarily here. But I can't leave out Alma. Uh, Alma is, of course, a major player in everything involved with this. And there are certainly many targets that should be available out there with, with some sort of sub-arc second resolution. But these things are faint. And the number of ones that you could get at the kind of 0.1 arc second resolution that you could get in, in scattered light with Alma is relatively small. However, we've already seen uh, some lovely pictures. This is AU MIC and HD 21997. Again, you know, you get these horseshoes just like you have in, in the young stellar objects uh, and, and non axisymmetric symmetric uh, uh, types of stru structures in these things. So I'm sure we will be uh, looking forward to seeing lots more uh, Alma pictures of disks. And there are a couple of posters out here that I'd like to draw your attention to. So there's also some thermal infrared being done from the ground. It's hard. It's like doing, uh, you know, doing thermal infrared from the ground is like you're having your telescope made out of fluorescent light bulbs. But uh, some of these things are pretty bright, and you can see resolved structures at 18, 20 microns uh, from some of our largest ground-based telescopes. Uh, some of these things are showing up as, as resolved, but kind of barely resolved, but they're very interesting in providing constraints at the short wavelengths, the warmer dust material for some of the ones that are best studied uh, out at the very long wavelengths. So here's our Fab Four once again, looking at it at the, uh, with a Spitzer imaging, uh, especially Fomalhaut's ring is starting to show up. But even with Spitzer, the resolution was uh, something close to 20 arc seconds at 70 microns. So you don't get the, the wonderful uh, uh, tight pictures that you do uh, from Hubble. But you still have a lot of information here. Here is Fomalhaut's ring uh, in scattered light. Spitzer shows that there is a, a belt of ma warm material inside of that ring at 24 microns. Here was a lovely Herschel picture that shows uh, you know, some of that uh, inner belt and probably uh, photospheric emission at 70 microns, uh, and that you've got a brighter uh, area in the disk uh, on this side. And here's Alma. Alma pretty much saw one side of, of the, uh, uh, the Fomalhaut ring, but saw it at exquisite resolution. So 
Here we, we see that the, the rings and the non-axisymmetric structures in them uh, tell us, uh, uh, you know, what we hope is about uh, a planet that is interior to, to the ring and that uh, you will get, uh, you know, non-axisymmetric structures in there because of the presence of the planet. Uh, of course, we thought we had found this planet, but we haven't. This is a different one that's causing some of these structures in the Fomalhaut ring, and we have to continue to look for them. So Epsilon Airy, again, one of the, the Fab Four. Uh, it's, uh, it's a more solar-type star. And the uh, information that we've gotten from Spitzer show, again, the, and I will back up for a moment, that Epsilon Airy has been known for a long time as this great big ring around the, the star. But when Spitzer looked at it, it showed uh, PSFs at all the different wavelengths. So there's material that's inside of this huge outer ring in the Epsilon Airy system. And what we think now is that it may have up to three different asteroid belts in it. There's this huge outer comet belt, as it's, as it's called here, an outer asteroid belt and an inner asteroid belt. And the inner asteroid belt probably defines a region that's similar to our inner solar system. And so that's, that's pretty interesting. So now Herschel is getting into the game. We've got a bunch of new stars uh, that are being resolved. These things are not being resolved at, with fabulous resolution, but the fact that they are resolved at all gives us wonder, con wonderful constraints on the models of, of where the dust is in these systems. Uh, you know, tens of AUs, 100 AU. Uh, these are typical sizes for these debris disks. Uh, and uh, so the big surveys, uh, the dune surveys, the debris survey, have come up with, with many uh, of, of these objects. Uh, and here's a, a particular one that's, that's a, 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 an eight arc second uh, disk with a, with a cleared central uh, region. Uh, here's a planet host star that's been done with Herschel with, uh, with a resolved disk. Uh, you know, and, and Jeff Bryden has been working on many of these things and Bohr et al. did this one. Uh, and just tens of A stars out there that are resolved at 70 microns uh, with Herschel. Uh, that, that are forming a, a, you know, a lovely database of things to follow up uh, with, with Alma and, and JW. So now we can get to the point where we can start to make an inventory of these things. And so if I did a complete inventory of all of the Herschel things that have just been recently published, this would go from for pages and pages. So I've only got a couple of pages here, but at the bottom, many new Herschel A stars, et cetera because Herschel has been making some of the, the greatest progress in defining uh, new resolvable uh, uh, debris disks. Uh, but these are the, the, the targets that we are going to be using the, the big new telescopes in the future to follow up, uh, you know, plus whatever uh, we can get out of, of WISE as well. So one way that you can uh, look at the progress of resolved disks out here is Carl keeps this uh, database a uh, catalog of circumstellar disks, circumstellardisk.org, and it tells you, gives you a list of the objects, it gives you a category, MS remain sequence, Tari, uh, and over here is sort of a, a metric on how well resolved these are uh, relative to the PSF, and, and you can keep track of which ones uh, maybe have a few beams across resolution, how many of them uh, are, are done in, in sub-arc second type of detail. So, uh, you know, we try to keep it updated, uh, give it a look. So, scattered light imaging, and, and this is, a, again, thanks to Jeff, uh, it, there is an opportunity for the future here, and that most of the, the disks that we've seen thus far in scattered light have been these really bright disks, you know, ten, with LD over L star, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 3. That's basically all the, that our current levels of contrast can do. Uh, with, with Hubble and, and from the ground, but there's a great amount of, of ex, uh, discovery space here in terms of uh, we know that, that many of the A stars out there and maybe many of, of the solar type stars as well have access at, at long wavelength. There's material that's out there that we should be able to see if we can push down to higher contrast uh, levels with our instrumentations. Now, of course, uh, a new player in this game is the Extreme AO coronagraphs. Here's a, a very recent uh, picture that's coming out of GPI, 
from, that, that Marshall pu and, and his friends have published uh, with this very nice, you know, high resolution, just beautiful uh, HR 4796 uh, disk. Again, this is a fairly young system, but it, uh, you know, it would not be considered a T-Tauri. It's a Stella debris disk. Uh, we've got uh, LBTI uh, that, that came online where we've heard about this a bit before. And this is not really so much of an imaging project as it is uh, constraining the amount of zodiacal dust around the nearby stars, which will help us in, in finding planets and, and doing uh, you know, a targeted surveys for debris disks in nearby systems. So the big new uh, telescope where we'll get in 2018 is JW. Uh, what will it look like? Well, it's not really optimized for doing coronography. Uh, the vibration level of the telescope is very important to what you get out of the coronagraph. So what is thought is that while the sensitivity will be vastly increased over Hubble, the amount of contrast that you're likely to get uh, for debris disk may not be greatly uh, improved. So we want to be very careful about how we target things, and I'm sure there's going to be the same old game of uh, being frustrated with uh, a lot of the targets there. So people should be patient and, and, uh, and, and try to optimize yield, and, and we'll get some great pictures out of JW, I'm sure. But it's not going to push down into our you know, very tiny amounts of dust out there. So at 25 microns, uh, we, we'll probably uh, pick up uh, another a couple of dozen debris disks uh, with their coronagraphic system. That will be quite interesting. So, uh, so here we have uh, just a few objects here that have been seen in scattered light. Lots of these things have been marginally resolved with, with Herschel. And there's, this, again, this huge opportunity if we can improve the contrast of our observations with coronography at short wavelengths, we should be able to, to be just getting uh, buckets and buckets of debris disks. So the contrast for these things is certainly less challenging than it is the 10 to the minus 10 for Earth-type planets. Uh, certainly, this is uh, part of, the, of what uh, the future coronagraph missions can be looking at. So one of the ideas for this is this, uh, uh, is this coronagraphic probe mission with an off-axis uh, coronography optimized telescope with uh, strong vibration isolation uh, with a Kepler type spacecraft. This is one of the two uh, uh, STDTs uh, competing with the, the, uh, uh, the Starshade mission just to define the way these, uh, these missions might look uh, if they were chosen as an alternative to the uh, after the coronagraph or perhaps uh, something in the decadal survey. So just to summarize here, the debris imaging is, uh, provides essential information. We have lots of uh, spatially resolved uh, debris disks now, but most of these are not terribly well resolved. Maybe 20 of them uh, right now uh, of all the debris disks known in the sky, uh, of all the hundreds or maybe even a thousand of them are, are really well resolved. Uh, the companions per perturbing these debris disks and forming these unusual structures are a big source of, uh, uh, of study from uh, ground-based coronography uh, looking for young planets in these systems. Uh, but what we've gotten thus far with, uh, with Spitzer, Wise, and Herschel are probably going to be what we go with uh, all the way out to the era of maybe the you know, TMT and, and GMT and, and uh, possibly a future larger space telescope, so thanks. The, the question is, is there a correlation between the presence of planets, but say radial velocity planets, just to make it simple, because uh, you know, one of the last places you want to go look for debris disks is the, is the, the Kepler field. It was right in the galactic plane, terribly confused. Uh, I think that the, uh, the jury is still out on this. There, uh, as to, certainly there are wonderful examples, uh, uh, HR 4799. Uh, sorry, 8799 with the four planets ha also has a debris disk. But I don't think that there is a, a, is a very well uh, known correlation. Jeff, do you have any comment about this? Okay, so Jeff says that there is a correlation between planets and debris disks. We always thought there would be. This was one of our ways of getting at planetary systems before we could detect planets. 
So we wanted there to be, but you know, in the Spitzer era, it wasn't clear. But now with Herschel, I think it's, it's better. Well, this is right. And uh, Wise is a little bit worse for this, well, maybe a lot worse than this, than, than Spitzer is. Spitzer has a smaller, uh, smaller beam. You're less likely to, to get other things in there. But you're always, when you have an all-sky survey, you're going to pull out every chance superposition that there is. So one of the important things to do with these, uh, these large surveys is to look at high resolution, uh, you know, AO, do whatever you can to try to, to see whether it's some sort of a star plus galaxy. Any way you can get at it. I mean, we, we already went and pulled out two mass, any type of high resolution optical imaging from the ground to try to, to get at the confusion problem. But I still think that these, uh, uh, that, that one needs to be cautious about these because there's still a, a substantial contamination rate. I mean, you should expect from the extragalactic background uh, that for the, you know, for at bright levels, for bright stars, there might be, uh, you know, only uh, a few uh, extragalactic sources that could compete with the stellar photosphere at, at 22 microns. As you go fainter and fainter, you know, the vermin become more numerous. <laughs> And, and the contamination rate goes up, up, up as you go to fainter and fainter stars. So de definitely be more cautious with, uh, with surveys of faint stars with, with these large surveys.